Hey everyone, it's Byron again. I'm here to testify for Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through Romans chapter 2, or at least begin going through Romans chapter 2. And I thought of some things that um, were similar or things that maybe could be used while looking at Romans chapter 2. And that's John chapter 8 and also Matthew chapter 5. I, I put those videos together yesterday. And I want to just play a clip out of John chapter 8 and get us kind of focused in a certain way of consideration. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and sin no more. So we can see from this story a couple things that maybe need to be considered throughout our whole life, but also while we think about what is Paul trying to write in Romans chapter 2. First and foremost, the story that's illustrated here by the men who caught this woman in adultery, um, every single one of them were guilty of some breakage of the law of God. There was no one willing to cast the first stone. They had brought an accusation up as if they were all something. But when confronted and having to face the real truth, which is none of you have kept the law, they all walked away. And then we also see that Jesus did not condemn her. He told her to go and sin no more. And if you remember from the last video I did where I was talking about my um, confession, in Romans chapter 1, in there I talked about how I was agitated with how people are in this world in these days. Scripture even tells us that, you know, the love of many shall wax cold because iniquity shall abound. And there's plenty of iniquity out here. Things to get frustrated with. The thing that really bothered me was I just want to put it into it. I'm not the patience that is that God has which we're going to learn about right here in Romans chapter 2. The, God's patience far exceeds my patience. I, I don't have the patience, even though I know at one point in time, I did the very things that I don't have patience for anymore. So praise God for the Holy Ghost. Praise God for my wife holding me back. And praise God for some friends of mine I talk to once every week, one in particular who consistently says, tells me, Byron, chill out, dude, Okay. So anyway, that's a, a thing from Romans, I mean, excuse me, from John chapter 8, in which I think maybe we brought away two things. One is, when Jesus came to this earth, he didn't come to condemn anyone. He came to save people from condemnation, and he did it by giving his life for us. And then two, you look out here in all this world today, and you think, well, so-and-so's got his act together and he's over here and he just looks like he's just all that. Um, I'm even embarrassed to get around him. I used to be afraid to go to church because I felt like I was too unclean to even go to church. But the fact is every single last person on the face of the earth have not lived up to God's standards of righteousness by the law. That is the fact. And that's very important because if you can't grasp that it's impossible to keep the law, and no one has ever done that except Jesus Christ, 
If you can't grasp that fact, there is so much more available to your understanding and to your development in Christ Jesus that you're going to miss. You're, you're just, you're not going to be able to get there. You can't fly with the eagles until you come to the realization you are a corruptible body and you have already been corrupted from the day you were born. You were born in corruption. So that's a point that I thought was pretty good to bring up before going into Romans uh, chapter two. The next thing I selected was uh, something out of Matthew chapter five. <clears throat> and in essence, what you're, what I'm about to play to you is the way the, my understanding of this is if the law wasn't already difficult to keep before Jesus got here, by the time Jesus finished putting extra twist to it he made it impossible to keep and that as you go into this Matthew chapter 5 just think about the amount of people that want to really do well and and keep the law and Jesus come along and makes it more difficult by what he's saying ye have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay, guys, right there, Jesus is talking about adultery. For you men, you know, we're visual. He's basically telling you that you may walk around this earth and you may think, well, I've never committed adultery on my wife. But he's also presenting to you this measure right here. Have you ever looked at another woman to lust after her? And if you have, you've committed adultery in your heart. I hope that you can see the level of difficulty that this puts on us from the law. And I truly believe that Jesus was really trying to convince these people, guys, if you, if you try to keep the law, it's going to bring you to me because you're going to realize you got to give up and you come to me. Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30. I'm going to put it right here. I'm about to play it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I tell you, I just took time out to actually put together Matthew 11 video, and then took that little segment out. But just as I, just as I finished or broke to do that, you know, I was crying, and then I, <clears throat> I thought about, Great is thy faithfulness. And I sang it for a while. I just worshiped the Lord there for a little while, waiting to get into that video. So Jesus wants to bring us to him. He, he said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. There, to, to keep the law, that's a, that's a surmountable task. And then add to that what Jesus just said about adultery. And also in the same chapter, he talks about murder. He says, if even if you're angry with somebody, it's like doing murder in your mind. He says, go and bring your offering. You know, if you're going to bring your offering, go into that person and reconcile things. Jesus came along and said things that made the law more difficult. And yet there's still people who are so prideful, they want to. They want to say, I can keep this law. I can do it. I can do it. And I can tell you, it's like a fighter. If you, if you watch a boxing man where a fighter is just, you know, he's been beat down, they have a referee because the referee can step in and stop the fight because there are fighters who don't know enough to take care of themselves. They don't know when to stop. They'll just keep fighting. They'll get back up and get knocked back down. They'll get back up. And the referee finally just stops it. At some point in time, People have to give up. They have to realize how weary they are in laboring to keep this law 
of God. Man, our righteousness, no matter how good it gets, it's like filthy rags to the Lord. So, with these three things in mind, or these three chapters in mind, the portions of the chapters that we've talked about, John chapter 8, Matthew chapter 5, and now Matthew chapter 11, with those things in mind, I want to begin to look at Romans chapter 2. Because I feel like that's a good way to put us in the mindset of what Paul's talking about beginning in Romans chapter 2. And again, I want to remind you of my confession. You know, I didn't. I don't have patience, man. Um, I think it's, you know, I've talked about how people are raised. There's a certain portion of me that thinks, well, I was raised in an intolerable situation, which, meaning we, we, we were not that tolerant. For an example, I was talking to my cousin one time, and I said, what do you do about tailgaters? He said, man, I stand on the brake. That means just, you know, as soon as somebody comes up with you in a car, I don't know if it's called tailgating in other countries, but you're driving and somebody's right behind you. And instead of my mindset being, well, don't slow down because I may hit you, our mindset, the, 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 the psyche that we have is to just hit the brake. And challenge that person. If they want to get out of the car, then get out the car. We'll just, you know, we'll we'll settle this tailgating right now. That's the kind of mindset that I have. And I have to fight against it. And, you know, when I say I have to fight against, the Lord has helped me tremendously through the Holy Ghost. Because there was a time when I was angry at everybody. I mean, man, golly bump. And I remember one time I told my wife, I said, do you realize how long it's been since I've been mad at another driver? And it had been some time, and I didn't even recognize it, but the, the God had took that from me. But if I'm not careful, I'll just let it just fester back up. It is a corruptible body that we live in. We have to acknowledge it. A portion of understanding and coming to the full knowledge of what God has for you is realizing you need help and crying out for help. You know, people talk about alcoholics. They want to you know, the first step in, you know, probably being a, the first step on the road to recovery is the knowledge you got a problem. Well, you know, whatever you want to say about alcoholics, that's cool. But it's similar with Christians. <clears throat> the first step is really giving up and saying, I need help. And the only help that you're ever going to get that is worth anything is from our Lord Jesus Christ, who already did it all for you. If you just give up let him take over, take his yoke upon you and learn of him and ye shall find rest for your soul. I consider that yoke to be the Holy Ghost. Just take it. It came down from heaven. Just let it fall on you. Just like a yoke falls on a horse. You know, you put it on a horse, put it around the horse's neck and he can pull all day. You know, just let it fall on you and then you start pulling. Okay. All right. Let's start Romans chapter two. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. You see what I'm talking about? Already Paul is saying, you people that are judging, you do the same things. Think back to Matthew chapter 8. We read about the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus said to her accusers, let he who is without sin among you, be the first one to cast a stone. Nobody casts a stone because everybody's guilty. You take a situation where you're dealing with the law of God, even though in chapter one, we saw these people over there that were doing all kinds of stuff that just, just drives us crazy, maybe. But we're trying to judge them and say, well, they're never going to make it to heaven doing like that. And Paul's got something for that coming up. But we have to realize we're all guilty. I mean, you know, <laughs> One time, one of my relatives was in a social help program, and one lady in there said about another lady, said, well, I don't know who she thinks he is because we're all crazy. <laughs> we're all sinners. We all, I'm, I'm telling you, before Christ, we were all guilty, every last one of us. I don't care if you're a Jew and you're under the law, and Paul's going to get into that, or you're a Gentile and not under the law. Guilty. Guilty as charged. So any judgment we try to make on someone who hasn't come to Christ yet, that's an error. Because we were jacked up just like them at one time. I mean, you, you, how can you say, well, my degree of sin was not as bad as his degree of sin? When if you 
you know, one tittle of the law. You break one tittle, you're guilty, period. Okay, let's go on. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? He just said something big, man. Do we despise God's patience, his long suffering, the goodness of God, and act like we don't know that his patience, his long suffering, leads people to repentance? Man, I was so messed up. <laughs> Look, <laughs> just a little a little about me. I got four DUIs. Four DUIs. That's not counting the times I was driving while intoxicated and didn't get caught. That's just the ones I got caught. There were times, man, when I would pass out from drinking. There were times when I was I was on an antidepressant and drinking, and I didn't know what I did. People had to tell me what I did. You know, no recollection of the night before. And, and then someone would come along, they would be bold enough to say, well, <clears throat> my gossiping isn't as bad as your drinking. It's all the same. My backbiting isn't as bad as your drug problem. It's all the same. I mean, you know, there's we can rationalize in our flesh the differences, but in God's eyes, guilt is guilt. So we should not despise this period of time God has given people to come to repentance. Again, my confession I did earlier, you know, where I lack patience, that God has patience. It's, I, I throw it out there for, for you to realize I'm not pointing a finger at you. <laughs> I'm guilty, too. We have to realize God's goodness leads people to repentance and give it time. And in the meantime, we occupy and do our jobs like we're supposed to do, man. So let's go on. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. This is the point I just want to mention one thing. In a sports or an athletic competition, you all play on the same field or you play on the same court, you run on the same track. No one person can say, well, I had it more difficult because I had to run up a hill and you didn't. Or no one person can say, well, my court was slippery and yours wasn't because we're all on the same court. At this point in time, God, I mean, Paul has leveled the playing field. Jews, you got issues. Gentiles, you got issues. Every last one of y'all, you're on the same court and it's level, period. You need Christ. That's where he's going. He's going to the point where he's going to literally tell you the only way out of this is to Christ. And it takes him a long time to get there because he develops this over the course of eight chapters from Romans 1 all the way to Romans chapter 8. But you, you, you can't shortchange coming to the full understanding of what Paul's trying to get to. At this point in time, he's basically just leveled the court. None of you can say, well, I was born a Gentile and I wasn't a Jew, so I, I lack this. Or I was born a Jew and I wasn't a Gentile. No, you're all on the same page now. You're all on the same court. You're all on the same track. You're all on the same field. If you're going uphill, you're all going uphill. If you're going downhill, you're all going downhill. There is no excuse at this point. Everything's fair and equal. For as many as have sinned without law, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. 
For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. As he just said something really important right there, he's talking about the Gentiles, and the Gentiles keeping the law by nature. And by nature, he also goes further and says, uh, who have the law written in their hearts. He's talking about a Gentile who has been saved by the grace of God. And the Holy Ghost has come on him. And now he performs his daily routine by nature in good. Because the Holy Ghost is leading him. He's, he's, he's going to talk later about walking in spirit in Romans chapter 8. But he's already referring to it right here. He's saying that a Gentile who didn't have the law, a Gentile who was didn't even know God before, is now with God. Because they're a law unto themselves because they have the Holy Ghost. They do by nature the things contained in the law because they have the law written into their hearts. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. As here's one of the reasons I did the videos earlier about when I, when I talked about the circumcision and uh, being in bondage from Galatians and stuff like that, is that men... <laughs> It doesn't matter what you are outwardly. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter if you know a lot about the law of God, etc. It doesn't matter if you teach the law of God. Each and every person has broken the law. The, the scriptures tell us there is none righteous. No, not one. Something like that. That's, that's the scripture. That's God's teaching us. There's none righteous before God based on the law. So Paul is saying, you guys, circumcision, the, the outward show that you got, the outward appearance that you got, the circumcision, it's no good because you break the law. So your, uh, your circumcision is counted as uncircumcision. You might as well be a heathen, a Gentile, because you broke the law. It, man, it's crazy. He's taking this thing down to where no one has anything to prop themselves up by, to stand on and cheat. We're all standing on the same level floor. And it comes down to, will you be bold enough to render yourself useful for Christ? Are you going to keep kicking and fighting and trying to do your best yourself? That, that's what it comes down to. Let me go on. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God.